brilliant that the recording started um so yeah just can say very quickly welcome to everybody who's joined the call um we're really excited to be joined by um Jim Moore today and also representation and Graham Cooper and um, representation from the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust, including Joanne Jackson, um, to hear about a webinar for um, management fields of dissection in primary care. Um, and yeah, I'll hand over. Please go ahead. Thanks, Ray. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm I'm the, the way we're going to run this is I'm going to say a few words about the charity and then Joanne is going to tell her story, then I'm going to say a little bit about the epidemiology of aortic dissection and Jim's going to talk a little about management of the aortic, patients with aortic dissection in primary care and then we'll finish with a question and answer session if that's okay. So I am going to share my screen. We've got some slides here, here we go. Is that showing to everyone? Uh, yes, I've got it. Great, thanks uh, for that. So yes, that's uh, that's who we are, and um, and uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. So the only the second charitable trust is I'm a trustee of that as well as being a cardiac surgeon. It's been in existence for just over two years now. And uh, these are the these are the the team, as it were, all of whom, in some way, have been affected by uh, aortic dissection. Uh, Catherine and Pauline, because they've lost loved ones to it, and Bob, Steve, and Sharon are all patients who have suffered an aortic dissection. And our aims are to uh, improve. The patient pathway across the whole the whole patient pathway for patients with aortic dissection, and we do that through three means: uh, education with events such as this, but we work also work for the, with those responsible for healthcare policy to try and improve the consistency of treatment for patients with aortic dissection, and we also uh, support research, including funding research into aortic dissection, and. There's a whole bunch of stuff. If you're interested in looking further into it, there's a whole range of stuff on our website, including the um, field guide for primary care, which we wrote uh, in collaboration with the primary care cardiovascular surgery. And that is on the PCCS website as well as ours. And you can download that or read it on your computer as you wish. So I am going to stop sharing my screen now and just hand over to Joanne, who's going to tell her story, and then I'll be back with you after that. I think you're, mu you're muted, Joanne, I think. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so, as Graham said, my name's Joanne. I'm 50 at the moment, unfortunately. <laughs> I live in Cheshire with my husband and son. Um, so I thought I'd start off just by giving you a little of my medical history. Um, so I was diagnosed age 13 with Marfan syndrome. Um, and at the age of 35, I had a aortic root replacement with a mitral valve repair at Withenshaw Hospital, which is local to me. So in 2012, when I was 39, I had a type B aortic dissection. So this was two weeks before my 40th birthday. Early on a Wednesday morning, woke up, turned over in bed and immediately had a severe pain in my chest that was followed by a ripping sensation. So it was from left down to the bottom right. It, I remember saying several times to medical staff that it was almost like a zip. It felt like a zip being undone top left down to bottom right um it was just yeah i say it was just like a zip so it was followed by intense back pain and a very clammy feeling i also felt very very nauseous so i'd never I mean, in my whole life i've had medical problems all through my life uh, with marfan syndrome but i've never actually felt the need to call an ambulance for anything but i knew i just knew instinctively that i needed an ambulance I felt really, really ill and I had a really intense feeling that I was dying. I just felt 
very, very poorly. So my husband dialed 999 and the paramedics arrived. They couldn't find any sign of a problem with my heart. Um, so I was reassured but and they weren't overly worried. But due to my history, I was taken to the, a the local A&E, which is actually Leighton Hospital in Crewe. I had a chest X-ray and an ECG, which both showed no issues. I was given pain relief, which was morphine and intravenous paracetamol, which is very good stuff. So they both made the pain feel much better. So after two hours, I was sent home. Um, they said to me it was just undiagnosed abdominal pain, paracetamol every four hours. So I felt really poorly. For the next 48 hours, I was in absolute agony. I couldn't get comfortable. I couldn't sleep. But I, I felt I'd been told I was fine. So I just didn't know what to do. On Friday morning, my dad came around to see me and pleaded with me, just go and see your GP, just see what he has to say. He knew my medical history. So I was fortunate I got in to see my GP on the Friday morning. He had a look at me, listened to my story and said, just hang on a minute. He said, I think you need to go to the hospital again. So he got me booked into a different local hospital. I got there, told them my story. They gave me a CT scan um, and instantly I was diagnosed with a type B aortic dissection. I was transferred to Withenshaw Hospital where they scanned me again and saw that the, the dissect, dissection had actually got bigger. So I was then moved over to Liverpool Hospital. Um, they have an amazing car cardiothoracic team. I spent three weeks in hospital where they got my blood pressure under control, nice and low, and then I was allowed home. I spent the next seven years uh, pain and symptom free, but finally have to, had to have surgery in 2020, uh, where I had my whole aorta replaced with a Dacron graft. This is a major operation, but I'm pleased to say that I'm now thankfully fully recovered and enjoying a full and healthy life again. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you, Joanne. And um, I suppose Joanne's story illustrates two important things about aortic dissection. One is that the issue about difficulty of diagnosis and that it's remarkable that uh, it was Joanne's GP who actually recognised that she was seriously ill. And secondly, the need for long term follow up because a lot of patients with aortic dissection subsequently need uh, surgery. So you'll be f very familiar with this. This is the ascending aorta or schematic of the ascending aorta. Three layers to the aortic wall, the intermedia and adventitia. And obviously blood normally flows through just the one lumen. Once you have an aortic dissection, a tear in the intima allows blood into the media and with each heartbeat, more blood is driven into the media and that extends this dissection along the length of the aorta. And clearly it, about half of people who have an aortic dissection die before they reach hospital. And that's almost always because the aorta ruptures because the wall is thinner. Obviously the dissected wall is thinner than the, the um, and therefore weaker than the normal wall. But also there can be problems with blood supply to branch arteries of the aorta. And this is just a little animation that explains that um, to you. So it runs for about two and a half minutes. And Acute then... aortic dissection. Consider it, diagnose it, exclude it. Acute aortic dissection is a time critical medical emergency. It affects 4,000 people. People of all ages in the UK and Ireland each year. Sadly, half lose their lives to the condition. Many die before reaching hospital. Although a time critical condition with catastrophic outcomes if not diagnosed, with prompt diagnosis and treatment, survival is at least 80%. If you consider aortic dissection, a CT scan is necessary to diagnose it or exclude it. A third of patients reaching hospital with acute aortic dissection are misdiagnosed. This is because few present with classical symptoms. They may be asymptomatic in reaching the emergency department or have a complex mix of transient symptoms affecting different organs. Understanding the pathophysiology of acute aortic dissection is key to understanding its presentation. The aortic wall has three layers, intima, media and adventitia. Aortic dissection occurs when a tear in the intima allows blood to enter the media 
With each heartbeat, blood is forced through the media, splitting its layers, creating a false lumen such that blood flows through two channels, the true and false lumens. In the acute phase, this is a dynamic process that may evolve in several ways until stable blood flow through both lumens is established. This dynamic phase may last minutes, hours or days. The splitting of the media causes a predominant symptom, sudden onset of pain. This may be in the chest, back, neck or abdomen or a combination of these sites. It is usually severe and is maximal at onset. Progression along the aorta may cause the pain to radiate. Once a stable blood flow in the true and false lumens is established, splitting of the wall ceases and the pain can subside. Stability occurs if a second intimal tear or re-entry tear allows blood back into the true lumen of the aorta. Or, if the pressure in the false lumen continues to rise, the aortic wall may rupture. And this is usually fatal. In the dynamic phase, increased pressure in the false lumen may cause it to compress the true lumen such that blood flow through branches of the aorta is compromised. This malperfusion is usually transient and gives rise to further symptoms. If malperfusion affects the coronary arteries, it will cause myocardial infarction. If cerebral blood flow is compromised, there may be neurological symptoms. These may be global and cause collapse or syncope. Or they may be focal and mimic a stroke or a transient ischemic attack. If mesenteric blood flow is compromised, there may be symptoms of bowel ischemia. There may also be symptoms and signs of limb ischemia. With a deeper understanding of the physiology of acute aortic dissection and why it can present with complex transient symptoms affecting different organs, you can successfully consider it, diagnose it and exclude it. Okay, so that explained the, I think, the pathophysiology of aortic dissection much better than I can. And I hope that all makes sense to you. Joanne mentioned that she had a type B aortic dissection, and there's the, the, the simple classification of aortic dissection is into two types: type A and type B. Type A dissection involves the it involves the ascending aorta. Type B, the descending aorta. The majority of people who have a uh, aortic dissection have a type A dissection, which is the more serious of the two classifications. So the incidence is about six per hundred thousand population, which means in the UK there's about four thousand people who die um, who have a dissection each year. Seventy percent of those type A, about half will die be before reaching hospital. And um, of those who do reach uh, hospital, only about two thirds actually end up undergoing surgery because of the issues with delayed and misdiagnosis. The prevalence of uh, aortic dissection is less well described, but it's somewhere around 20 to 30 cases per 100,000 population. So that means that a GP practice with maybe 10,000 people on the bot books is likely to have two or three patients who have had an a but that that is going to change because of the changing demographics of the population the uh, incidence of aortic dissection is predicted to almost double between 2020 and 2050 and uh, so that, that the, the issue of aortic dissection is going to become more common as time goes on. The majority of aortic dissections happen in, um, so the etiology of aortic dissection can be very complicated. The grey box on the right has got a whole list of um, potential causes, but the sort of simple way of looking at it is about 70% of cases are due to hypertension or atherosclerosis within the aorta, and the remaining 30% are usually because the patient has some uh, inherited um, risk of having an aortic dissection, such as Marfan syndrome, which uh, Joanne has, but it could also happen in uh, low state syndrome, Turner syndrome, Erdos type 4 Erdos Danlos. Uh, syndrome and and the common cause is bicuspid aortic valve. The 
as you'd expect, given the etiology, the majority of patients who have aortic dissection uh, in, uh, are in their 70s, but it does affect, for those who have an inherited condition, such as Joanne, it, it can affect them much longer, younger. And a quarter of people have an aortic dissection rate less than um, 50 years of age. So it can, in fact, occur at any age. Treatment of it depends on the classification. So for type A aortic dissection involving the ascending aorta, which is almost you always almost always fatal without surgery. The, the treatment is uh, immediate so surgical repair. These days, um, probably 80, 25 percent of people will survive that surgery. Um, for the type B uh, aortic dissection affecting the descending aorta, the majority of these are fairly uncomplicated and can be treated with medical treatment. So that's essentially blood pressure and pain control, as Joanne described in her talk. Um, but about 10% of patients with a type B dissection will have some complication, which is usually either related to malperfusion, so impaired blood flow to either the uh, either the guts or the, the the legs, or because of impending rupture. And for those, treatment is um, an endovascular stent. So we don't do open surgery for that condition anymore because the results with an endovascular stent are much better. There's about a 10% procedural mortality with that. But once over the acute phase, the survival for patients with aortic dissection is pretty good. Uh, this shows type A aortic dissection, but the, the survival curve for patients with type B dissection is um, very similar and 60, 70% 10 year survival rate after surgery, which um, is, 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 is obviously very good for what is a pretty serious and if not treated fatal condition. So as the little animation showed that um, in the acute phase with an aortic dissection, it's a very dynamic situation. But in the chronic phase, when you have stable blood flow through the true and the false lumens, that um, the principal risk, also, also all that dynamism goes, and the principal risk is expansion of the false lumen. And if that gets larger than about a six centimetre diameter, there is a significant risk of rupture so that is uh, a threshold at which generally people would think about uh, intervening and that can, the, the aorta doesn't expand very quickly it normally takes years some years from the point of having the aortic dissection to getting to a point of needing surgery i think joanne said it was six years in her case and that would be a fairly typical time course so it's crucial that patients after they had an acute dissection have, uh, have a specialised follow up and that usually involves an annual, we prefer MRI scans because of the radiation dose these days, scan of the aorta, making sure that their blood pressure is well controlled, any appropriate secondary, other secondary pre prevention that's necessary. And if they're less than 55 years of age, they may have an inherited ri uh, risk of um, aortic dissection, which they might have passed on to their children or their brothers or sisters may have, and so they should undergo uh, genetic screening. And, and finally, about almost half of patients who suffer an acute aortic dissection have some form of post-traumatic stress disorder, and so counselling can be uh, very helpful for them. Just a reminder again that there's a bunch of resources on our website if you'd like to find out more. And I will uh, just say thank you for having us. I'm going to end the slides show now and hand over to Jim, but happy to take any questions after Jim's talk to you. Thank you very much, Graham. Hopefully, you're going to see my slides. In a moment, if I just expand that. Yeah, we can see that, Jim. Fantastic. 
Um, delighted to have been invited to provide the primary care perspective um, at this meeting today. Um, I'm Jim Moore. I'm the current president of the Primary Care Cardiovascular Society and delighted to have been engaged with Graham and TADCT and the work that they are doing and to highlight the importance of this particular condition. So my remit is really to give you a primary care perspective. These are my interests. It's not a surprise that um, there are many people likely, many healthcare professionals likely to be involved in the care of someone with uh, aortic disease or aortopathy, uh, not least those who have had a dissection. And some of those individuals are listed around uh, this central picture. We very much encourage a multidisciplinary team approach in modern medicine, yet um, all too frequently we, we do not achieve a true multidisciplinary team approach and there are many reasons why that may be so, not least um, communication and that may be something that I may return to in this presentation. But we certainly know that silo working and silo working um, uh, and from my experience in cardiovascular disease does not benefit um, the patient. And where we have that multidisciplinary team uh, approach, the outcomes potentially are so much better. So you can see around this slide, the various people who may be involved, including um, GP, including your specialist team, specialist physicians, vascular team and surgeon. Um, Graham highlighted the importance of um, counselling, uh, psychological support, and I, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, he also highlighted that there may be a genetic component to this. And of course, there's imaging. Um, interesting at the bottom is, is fertility team. And one of the things I've been involved in recently is um, uh, supporting the production of guidelines uh, around medically assisted reproduction, what is best practice. And people with aortic disease or aortopathies are included in that risk. And for people who are interested in this particular area, so conception and risks related to pregnancy, I'd certainly direct you to a document produced by Kate English, which is uh, best practice in people uh, for medically assisted um, reproduction, but really it's relevant to people who are basically looking uh, with known disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, who are looking to becoming pregnant. And there's some really useful information. If you find yourself in pra practice, um, I know you'll often go and seek advice from your local specialist, but it's a document that can give you some um, instant, potentially an instant response to a question in primary care. OK, so these are the um, tenons of the, the management of uh, people with uh, aortic disease. Um, these are not necessarily and often will not be um, within the domain of primary care, but um, there, are certainly a, the, uh, there are certainly areas here which are relevant. Um, one often thinks about people unless they're uh, acutely unwell and dissecting with aortic disease as being asymptomatic, but of course that couldn't be further from the case. There are genetic um, causes of uh, aortic disease, including conditions such as Marfan's, and of course people with Marfan's syndrome may have other uh, may have other relevant symptoms related to them. Marfan's a connective tissue abnormality, so they may have musculoskeletal problems. Examination may reveal other significant findings. But as Graham said, I think fairly central importance to all of this is the management of hypertension. 70% of people will have hypertension as a cause for their underlying disease. And of course, the management and the appropriate management of hypertension lies firmly and squarely with us uh, in uh, primary care. So managing blood pressure well, and we know from the recent um, data 
through, as many of you will be uh, familiar with, uh, the CVD Prevent Audit, you know that uh, both our identification of hypertension and our management of hypertension is suboptimal. And that is why, as one of the NHSC priorities for this year, 23-24, um, that hypertension management is at the top of the list. And um, uh, we have a rather challenging uh, almost 80% of patients with a diagnosis of hypertension within primary care um, should, as one of the priorities, be managed to NICE targets. The baseline investigations, particularly around um, the aorta, will almost certainly be managed by a specialist team. And as Graham's outlined, will we'll, uh, involve some form of imaging, potentially CT, potentially MRI. It's also important, again, as Graham outlined, that the management of any other existing cardiovascular disease is important and particularly related to CVD risk. So in many of these patients, if they have hypertension, you, of course, are going to, if they've uh, no evidence of uh, or have no uh, cardiovascular events, they've not had myocardial infarctions or stroke, you're going to do a primary prevention CVD 10-year assessment on, of them, which will involve checking their lipids and other risk factors, smoking, etc., calculating their risk. And if it's appropriate, you will be considering manage th managing that risk with such things as lipid therapy. Um, again, as Graham outlined, um, underlying genetic cause for this is not uncommon and genetic screening, which of course I, will be initiated in secondary care, will be undertaken. And it's also important to think about family history, and I'm going to touch upon that later on. Surveillance screening, whether they're having um, uh, CTs on an annual or more frequent basis, depending on their uh, aortic diameter, will be um, uh, will be under the remit of the specialist team, as of course will surgical and medical treatment. And I've already touched around the importance of fa family planning. But I just show this slide, and it, it just reminds us um, of both the high risk conditions related to aortic dis dissection, the high risk features. Uh, both uh, related to pain and examination. Um, I must say, when I heard Joanne's story, I, I was a bit concerned that given her history, that um, a potential for an aortic dissection was perhaps at her first visit not immediately considered. It may have been considered. It obviously, if it was considered, wasn't acted upon. But I think, as you can see from the high-risk conditions, anyone with known thoracic aortic dilatation is at risk in the left-hand column alongside these other conditions. Um, the high-risk features, of course, we, we will rarely see someone presenting to us in primary care with the aortic dissection. But it's always worth keeping in the back of your mind. I think in my 35 years as a GP, I've probably seen uh, two people presenting with what I thought and was subsequently confirmed to be an aortic uh, thoracic uh, dissection. The importance of um, pain not only in the chest but in the back and of course um, abdominal pain, that ripping or tearing um, uh, description that Joanne gave. And certainly from what I can remember from the two cases I've seen, vomiting was certainly part of all of that. And there are examination findings, though I think we may rarely find ourselves assessing these, but a pulse deficit or a difference in blood pressure between arms is quite um, important. So what's the sort of things perhaps in primary care we may be asked about in relation to uh, aortopathies and aortic dissection? So. How should I exercise, if at all, doctor? Because I've got this dilated, big and important blood vessel, should I wrap myself in cotton wool and not undertake um, any exercise? Well, true. in keeping with many, many other cardiovascular uh, um, conditions, the answer is to that is no. Yes, some degree of activity and exercise is important. But it's important to consider what sort of exercise uh, would be recommended. 
So we know that exercise will increase your oxygen demand and increase your cardiac output. It will have effects upon your pulse rate and blood pressure. And I think it's important to differentiate here between static um, exercise. So that's exercise when you are still and basically working on one repetitive exercise as opposed to dynamic um, exercises. Many will be familiar with the, the, the term peripheral vascular resistance. It's your peripheral vascular resistance in those 60,000 miles of blood vessels that we have. It's the resistance that actually dictates what uh, blood pressure is. As the resistance within uh, those blood vessels increases due to vasoconstriction, then the work of the heart goes up. And as the work of the heart goes up, the blood pressure uh, goes up at the same time. So we know in dynamic exercise, and an example may be out and walking or fast walking, then your peripheral vascular resistance actually diminishes, which is a, a, a positive thing from the point of view of uh, cardiovascular, um, from a cardiovascular point of view. Your blood pressure will go up. And dynamic exercise. So when people on treadmills, when we're looking, exercising them for chest pain, which we um, less often do these these days, but we will expect to see a rise in their blood pressure as a normal response to exercise with a, a mean increase in their, their blood pressure. And after they've exercised, their blood pressure will return to normal fairly quickly. We know that in uh, athletes who are undertaking dynamic exercise, those who are doing triathlons, the elite athletes, that we will see some increase in the diameter of their aorta. So compare that with static exercise, an example may be um, weightlifting. And we know that um, uh, during that form of exercise, um, you will see an increase in vascular resistance, therefore an increase in the work of the heart, therefore an increase in blood pressure. And as you can see, that increase both in the mean and the systolic blood pressure are really, really significant you know, up to 480 millimetres of, of mercury. And the mean BP, where you're seeing diastolic blood pressure means of 350. These are huge increases in blood pressure. We also know that with Valsalva, and again, that's a common thing during static exercise where you're straining, say, to lift um, a bar with some weights on it. Um, during that surge, as you're blowing out and doing the Valsalva, you will see a drop in blood pressure. But immediately after, you get a, a, a significant surge in blood pressure after Valsalva. Uh, and again, in those who are doing, uh, in athletes who are doing static forms of exercise, you will see um, an enlarged aorta. So big difference between dynamic and um, static activities. Many will be familiar with the term MET, uh, metabolic equivalence. One MET is the, the uh, metabolic activity when we're sitting and resting. And what you can see here are um, related METs um, associated with other activities. So if we're doing light activity, perhaps up to two METs. If we're running at eight miles an hour, that's seven and a half minute miles, and that's pretty hard work, then you are consuming 13.5 um, minutes, and you can see the different forms of activities um, between. We know that post-dissection, the recommended daily activity is off five minutes. So you'd kind of draw the line on the list that you have in front of you from dancing or perhaps ice skating and uh, below. So which exercises would be safe? And those are the ones that you can see in front of you. I, I do wonder um, about some that are recorded here. Interested in Graham's view, perhaps, when we come to discuss that. I'm not sure whether it should be walking football. Um, as someone who still plays football and in an air covers about five miles, five to six miles, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily managing under five. Uh, the five Mets had I had a um, dissection. But these are all low impact and, and low resistance activities where you're unlikely to have that valsalva type straining type um, effect. What should be avoided? Well, again, it's pretty predictable. Uh, weightlifting, wrestling, rowing, um, rugby. No doubt if you're in, in, in a, a, 
uh, a scrum. These are all conditions that ideally should be um, avoided. Um, we're not infrequently and not frequently enough um, uh, asked about sexual activity um, by our patients. And when we remember, we should be, in fact, asking um, our patients or indeed informing our patients around uh, sexual activity. In aortic disease, it's probably worth knowing that the, um, the METs that are expended are somewhere in sexual activity between three and six depending on your age, um, depending on your activity, and also depending on whether it's your regular partner of not. But I think the, the advice would be that sexual activity is safe, any aortic disease, but avoid straining or maximal um, exertion. And you can see some of the uh, um, relative, uh, relevant physiological effects that are there. Altitude, we know that as uh, the higher we get, the more likely that we are to encounter hyperbaric hypoxia. And we know that hypoxia, one of the, the related physiological effects is an increase in blood pressure. You can see that um, part of the regulations for pilots uh, is that they, they're unable to fly if they have any form of aortic dilatation. And DVLA, again, something that's very relevant. Graham has already outlined that, that important line in the sand um, around uh, six centimetres. So you can drive if you have an aneurysm diameter that's less than six centimetres, between six and 6.4. You should notify DVLA that you, you do have one. And if it's over six and a half, then uh, you should not. Um, drive. But for those who have undergone surgery, it's possible that they can be relicensed in the long term. It's also important just to outline the importance of a bicuspid valve. Again, Graham outline, um, suggested that was one of the more significant inherited underlying potential causes of an aortopathy. Um, uh, bicuspid valves have a uh, an important genetic component to them. So if you have someone within the family with a bicuspid valve, it makes it much more likely that you actually have one. And some form of screening may well be appropriate in the longer term. Other lifestyle considerations, well, it, it, without, I mean, we, we, we of course would recommend and help and support people who smoke and who uh, we would not recommend that they smoke, but we would try and engage them with services to help them to uh, with smoking cessation. Um, contact sports, particularly conditions such as uh, Marfan syndrome, where there's risk to the lens and the eye becoming um, dislodged. And also in Marfan's, we know that um, uh, sleep apnea is a pretty common finding um, and again, sleep apnea has been shown in Marfan's group to have a greater association with aortic complications in the longer term. So very important in that Marfan's group to ask questions around the possibility of sleep apnea and where that they should be properly investigated for this. Posture education, again, relates to some of these um, uh, connective tissue diseases like Marfan's, where other musculoskeletal abnormalities are common, kyphosis or ky uh, kyphosis abnormalities of the spine, etc., where some physio input around um, posture is quite important. And we've already uh, highlighted in some of the previous slides the importance of drug use, drug use cocaine um, in particular. So once someone's had the dissection, what sort of follow-up um, exists? We're just going to look at specialist follow-up first and then primary care follow-up. So there will be ongoing surveillance once that diagnosis of dissection is made. Um, typically, there'll be um, uh, an annual CT or MRI, potentially much more um, frequent depending on dilatation of the aorta. And again, that, there's that threshold of six centimetres. And as Graham describes, in some people, 
um, there may be consideration for interventions under six centimeters, depending on pre-existing comorbidities. One of the questions I have, and this comes from my my experience in one of one of my particular patients with a uh, thoracic um, aortic dissection, is how will that follow up be organised? And who's actually going to review the images and reports? Um, so I work in an area that has a DGH. It doesn't have a university teaching hospital or a, a tertiary centre. Tertiary centres are about 50 miles away from where I am. And often the care of patients who've had th thoracic aortic dissections is handed back um, typically to the local cardiologist to arrange the imaging and, and uh, the follow-up. But this often happens virtually. And um, it becomes really quite, uh, certainly in my particular case, became quite difficult to understand who was going to organise the imaging, who was going to look at the reports and act upon them. So more noise in the system than really should be there. And it comes back to this communication around the multidisciplinary team. In terms of screening, um, again, uh, Graham covered this um, uh, earlier on, but genetic testing be offered to people aged less than 60 years. I think Graham suggested 55 years old. Those with connective tissue disease or those who have a family history of an aortic um, dissection. And where we identify that there's an underlying inherited condition, of course, we should then be thinking about pedigree and thinking about first degree relatives uh, screening, so um, which will involve uh, assessing genetics and also imaging of the aorta. And where there's the presence of a bicuspid aortic valve, it'll involve echocardiography, where, uh, where the index case has had uh, identified as having a bicuspid valve. From a primary care follow-up, it's back to hypertension. Um, target BP of less than 130 over 80. There was one publication that suggested we should be looking at even lower targets, and this was in a group who I think had had a type A dissection, had had um, surgical, successful surgical in um, uh, intervention, and uh, where a systolic blood pressure of 120 had better outcomes than those um, above. But your specialist team, again, should communicate what they feel is the important target blood pressure. And if it isn't um, communicated, then the question should be asked of the specialist team, what should be, we be looking to achieve? In terms of uh, medications, the evidence would suggest uh, using beta blockade and or so in addition, because as we know, um, the average number of uh, antihypertensives that a hypertensive population need is two in general and above. Um, sadly, we there is a tendency to under treat hypertension by using um, monotherapy. So um, in many of these patients, you will be looking particularly if you're achieve, uh, looking to achieve lower levels of blood pressure, you will be using combinations, uh, therapies or dual or triple therapy. So beta blockade and an ACE or uh, ARB shown in studies to lower the all-cause mortality and the number of hospital readmissions. And it's interestingly, when they looked at ARB use in this population versus ACE, um, there was more support for the use of ARBs as opposed to ACEs. And I think in general, ARBs in the management of hypertension are better tolerated than ACE inhibitors, not least because of the 15% or so. Um, mentioned earlier about the management of cardiovascular risk, that holistic approach to cardiovascular uh, risk. Um, although you may well be aware of the important national drive around managing hypertension well, you can't manage hypertension well without looking at lipids, without making sure that they don't have atrial fibrillation. And of course, if they've had a previous established vascular event, there are a number of other important therapies in addition to statin therapy that they will be eligible for. 
Graham mentioned the importance of counselling and psychological morbidity. 40% of people have post-traumatic stress disorder after their aortic um, dissection. And this is a particularly, and again, um, a particularly important area that we don't explore sufficiently. And of course, lifestyle advice, as I've just gone through, um, is important. Just returning to that question of mental health and aortic disease, this um, is from a study that looked at activities, a variety of different um, activities, uh, exercise related, um, uh, pre and post aortic dissection. And you can see the significant change in activity in the population who have had that uh, aortic dissection. So over three quarters reported a negative effect upon their um, lifestyle. Just as importantly, around about a third of people reported depression post um, aortic dissection. And I wonder in how many of those cases, um, routine cases that we see, do we actually explore this side and this particularly important comorbidity. And 20% of people have erectile dysfunction. So um, being aware of this, an important marker of quality of life, I think is really important and seeking, you know, providing support, seeking expert help where, whether it, where it's appropriate, whether it be through counseling or mental health hubs is very, very important. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jim. Um, Freya, how do you, how do we want to do the questions in the chat or hands up? Um, I think we can do a mix. It might be easier if people do hands up and then ask the question. But if people want to um, write them in the chat, I can monitor there. Okay. Any questions? Actually, I might, uh, Graham, just, just on that point around hypertension. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mentioned about hypertension. I'm just going to just give some emphasis to the, the modern approach to managing people with hypertension. And hopefully most of our audience from primary care will be familiar with the move which started during COVID towards doing home blood pressure monitoring, as opposed to doing one off blood pressures in a surgery. There is absolutely excellent evidence for the value of doing home blood pressure monitoring over and above doing one off um, measurements in surgery. It's part of NICE guidance. It is a national initiative around distributing home blood pressure monitors to um, patients. And we very much hope it's going to be the way of the future. But um, importantly, when in standard hypertension, we are aiming from an, for an in-surgery value of less than um, 140 over 90. When you're doing home blood pressure monitoring, you have to allow five millimetres of mercury difference. So your average home blood pressure equivalent to 140, 90 in surgery would be 135 over 85. But I think this is an important um, positive step in terms of better management of people with high blood pressure, which of course will have knock-on effects from the point of view of risks of aortic disease and aortic dissection. Um, we've just had um, a question come through in the chat actually saying um, that if there's a family history noted of aortic dissection, what is specifically tested for within the genetic testing screen? Um, so they would have some counselling first of all, because obviously the consequences of being identified to have an at risk gene, or the, being identified to have of ha as having an at risk gene um uh has some consequences but uh, it would be it would usually be a saliva sample that would be that looked for a panel of about 30 genes the multiple dissection the 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 um degree of association varies but there's a panel of about 30 genes so that they, they would be screened for if one of those genes was present and especially if it was present in the relative who had an aortic dissection then um there would 
be consideration of offering them prophylactic surgery, so replacement of the ascending aorta um, as an elective procedure, because that would uh, re remove the risk of dissection. And that's certainly certainly something we do do. I, hope that, I think that I think I, yeah I'm going to say Graham just just in addition to that certainly my experience with um, genetic departments is that the centre of primary care we can make that referral and the the individual that we we refer is usually has a conversation with one of the specialist nurses within the genetics team and they often have a particular expertise in one area uh, for instance we have um, a cardiovascular genetics nurse and, and as part of that assessment they will actually sometimes look at the clinical features for instance you know from Marfan's or mm -hmm. etc etc they're very knowledgeable and very useful in 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 that respect yeah absolutely absolutely Jim yeah. thank you um, and we just had another question through saying um do you know how many people will be referred to cardiac rehab post aortic dissection? So where I work, cardiac rehab is only available to patients who have yeah. had coronary artery bypass surgery or, or, or a MI, so not aortic dissection. I, I, that might vary across the country. I don't know, Jim, what, you probably know better than no, me. No, I, 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 absolutely. There, there are only specific groups and, and typically those who have had um, uh, valve, valve surgery, those who have had myocardial infarctions are considered increasingly one of the groups we are trying very hard um, to um, offer cardiac rehab to are people with heart failure so that from a national perspective is being um, pushed quite heavily because we know of the um, cost effectiveness of cardiac rehab in that particular group yet the numbers who are currently offered there are, are very very small but certainly um, uh, People with the uh, aortic dissection, I haven't come across that in any of the um, in any other areas, and certainly not in my area. Yeah, no, it's it's difficult, but it's probably you know, something I think. I mean, Jim said in uh, in his in his talk, one of the commonest questions I get asked by patients when we are having follow up conversations is, "How much exercise can I do?" You know how do i gauge what i can yeah. do and you know something like some cardiac rehab with some supervised exercise would probably be quite useful for that but not funded no um uh, absolutely and it usually comes down to us graham to to actually provide that that um that information and then um unless we have um you know good access to information then it, it we we tend to apply common sense to what we do but as i've shown it's it's quite important in this particular group what what you are recommending yeah. well, on the yeah. on the question of achieved you know what blood pressure you're looking to to achieve graham um i think it was from the document that you've shared with us it's on our website that you have 130 over 80 as your kind of standard um uh your uh, blood pressure that you're looking to achieve but would you would you look at lower levels in say younger population or particular subgroups within um you know the the dissection population yeah so the the 130 or 80 comes from um sort of the european and american guidelines on the management of patients with aortic dissection yeah. there is pretty good evidence that your risk of aortic dissection is um linearly related to your blood pressure so there's not so it's there's not a uh a, a sort of um plateau and then rise in your risk of aortic dissection with increasing blood pressure the higher your blood pressure the more greater the risk you have of an aortic dissection which sort of makes sense doesn't it um and um so there are certainly people who we would be who may we may be worried about they would I think typically be people who we would be concerned are at risk of an aortic or risk of further complications, but uh, who are either unwilling or not fit to undergo further into feasible. We might a bit lower, yes. 
I suppose in, in, in that younger population, it's perhaps it's often less of concern in, in the older population. So and I, 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 it was really useful to see those figures, almost 50 percent of, of people um, who've had dissections are, are under the age of 60. That, that I must say, Graham, that was a that was a surprise to me, that figure. But in that in that older population, and certainly again, this comes from experience. It's that caution around creating a circumstance where they're at risk of postural hypotension. So you may be able to correct their blood pressure when they're sitting, but in the older population, when they stand up or if they've yeah. got concomitant diabetes, then you've got that risk of postural um, hypertension. And and the data that comes from the the the, the post. Um, surgical data in the type ones. I think it was twenty-five years follow-up. They were looking at the um, uh, a, a systolic pressure of one twenty below or one twenty and above, and I think they showed potentially there may be some benefit in 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 a lower blood pressure. I think yeah, it's a, it's a, like all these things, Jim. It's a balance, isn't it? The lower the blood pressure, you can get the blood pressure. The lower the risk, I think, is yeah. what the uh, what the the literature would tell us. But the Certainly, the you know you have to balance that against postural hypotension, absolutely, etc., etc. Et yeah. But one of the, one of the other benefits of doing home blood pressure monitoring is you know you, we have a proportion of patients who's just simply being in surgery may may lead to less accurate results. So mm. having um, a number of readings that you can average out over can be quite reassuring. I, I've certainly again. I, I, I have um, professional experience of this with one patient, again, who had had a dissection, who when one checked her home blood pressures, they were very much more reassuring than the ones that when, um, when she attended surgery. Yeah. Yeah. I think it looks like we're just about bang on time, Freya. Yes. Um, and that's all the questions that have been entered into the chat as well. Um, so yeah, I think can bring to an end. Well, thanks very much for for uh, for joining us, Jim and Joanne. Thanks very much for your contributions, and Freya, thank you very much for organising it. I hope it's been useful for you. Yeah, brilliant, and thank you very much for coming and delivering so much information. <laughs> very <laughs> grateful. Welcome, pleasure. All right. Bye all. Thanks. I was going to say, Graham. Yes. Ask, all I was going to say, Graham, is if if you you wish my support in future with any, then happy to do so. Having brilliant. Having thank you. And, and thank you for the thank. You, thanks for the slides. No, oh, you're welcome. No, thank, and thank you. No, that was a great session. I think felt felt really good for from where I was. Brilliant. All right. Uh, thanks all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye.